This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Open any U.S. history book, and most of the people you'll read about are men. George Washington, Abe Lincoln, Daniel Boone, Lewis and Clark, William Penn, Ben Franklin. Obviously, there's something missing, because we know that women were not just tending home and hearth while men were out making history. From the beginning, courageous, intelligent, trailblazing women have been contributing to the building and shaping of our commonwealth and our nation yet they've often had trouble breaking into the history lesson lineup. In this edition of Rediscovering Pennsylvania History Makers, we shine the spotlight on one of them, Lucretia Mott. Quaker, abolitionist, women's rights advocate, social reformer, minister, co-founder of Swarthmore College. If the size and look of one's gravestone tells anything about a person buried there, this small stone represents Lucretia Mott very well. She was a modest, simple living Quaker woman, yet she helped turn society upside down during her lifetime and was one of the galvanizing forces in the social movements of the 19th century, working tirelessly to elevate those enslaved or discriminated against to the full rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Small of stature, just shy of five feet tall and under 100 pounds, Lucretia Mott was large in spirit and determination. She had what we would call today true Wizard of Oz traits, brains, heart, and courage. Undeterred by intimidation, even the threat of physical violence, she remained true to her Quaker pacifist upbringing and became a gladiator in word and deed in the arena of public advocacy for social change. Tackling the institution of slavery, advocating for women's rights, working to improve race relations, and striving for peace. She was anti-slavery and pro-women's rights and pro-temperance and pro-peace and all those kinds of things and she really didn't uh, see big distinctions between those issues and that wing of the reform movement didn't tend to see those big distinctions because everything is, is connected. As is true of a number of Pennsylvania history makers, Lucretia Mott was not a native Pennsylvanian. She was born in Nantucket, Massachusetts, and was sent to a Quaker boarding school in Dutchess County, New York, at the age of 13. Marriage to James, her partner in advocacy, was followed by a move to Philadelphia. Her faith tradition, the Society of Fringe, commonly called Quakers, formed her view of the world, especially in relation to the issue of slavery. She didn't just pop into the world fully, fully clothed. I'm suggesting she was clothed in a Quaker wardrobe. She was steeped in a Quaker bath and therefore understood that a Quaker bath had lots of different temperatures and lots of different minerals in the water. The Society of Friends had come to the conclusion by the 1770s that slavery was just totally incompatible with the Society of Friends and totally illegitimate. And that gets, you know, you, you even recognizing the legitimacy of slavery in any way was, was, was the wrong thing to do. But even among Quakers and others in the anti-slavery movement, there were sharp differences in approach. Quakers were very conflicted over how to react to slavery. Some of them thought, you know, it's enough that we've said we're not engaging in slavery, we're going to be this, you know, sitting on a hill kind of thing. The other ones, like Lucretia Mott, said, no, you've got to be active, you know, you've got to do something about it. You know, that's very important, that's very important. The Progressive Friends meeting, of which she was a part, and the Hittites tended to be a kind of in-your-face approach to things. They weren't violent, but they did, were, as a friend of mine put it, they were pacifist aggressive. Um, and 
Lucretia Mott was one of these pacifist aggressive types. I have no idea of submitting tamely to injustice inflicted either on me or on the slave. I will oppose it with all the moral powers with which I am endowed. I am no advocate of passivity. Quakerism, as I understand it, does not mean quietism. Though rarely mentioned today, Maud actually found herself among the giants of the abolitionist movement of the time. Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Harriet Tubman. But her effectiveness and the ability to have her voice required defying tradition and convention and the ability to face down protesters. Believing strongly in the power of word and action, she was a prolific lecturer and giver of sermons. Part of one sermon was the observation that generosity and almsgiving were not enough. It is not enough to be generous and give alms. The enlarged soul, the true philanthropist, is compelled by Christian principle to look beyond the bestowing of a scant pittance to the mere beggar of the day, to the duty of considering the causes and sources of poverty. The map of southeastern Pennsylvania is dotted with locations having a common identifying factor. Lucretia Mott spoke here. She did live in a time where, pe where people, um, even, even many Quakers, thought of women speaking in public. It was okay as long as they spoke to other women, but they weren't allowed to speak to promiscuous audiences. And by promiscuous, they meant, simply meant that there were two genders in the room. Um, and so she did carry her version of Quaker independence into speaking wherever she could be heard. Um, sometimes people wanted to, to have her dial it back or damper it down, but she didn't do that. Um, again, she was bringing with her a long tradition of her own and her family's and her meetings experience. Uh, it's not as if she invented the outspoken woman. It's that she saw it in the world around her and adopted it, made it her own. Even though she was shut out from speaking roles at abolitionist conventions, she founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, whose 60 members included both blacks and whites. Relegated to merely observing the 1840 General Anti-Slavery Convention in London, England, she began laying the groundwork for the women's rights movement in the United States. Encouraged by that gathering, she returned home and embarked on an aggressive speaking tour across the country, even earning a personal audience with President John Tyler at the White House. She also gave an anti-slavery lecture attended by 40 congressmen, all males of course, she also preached at black churches, a huge departure from the norms of the times. There is a tendency to think of the North as nearly universally opposed to slavery, but that wasn't the case. The 1838 Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women in Philadelphia, held at the newly constructed Pennsylvania Hall, was met with mob violence. The good citizens of Philadelphia didn't like the idea that there were going to be people of different races in the same building, and so they, a big mob assembles and they burn it down. And supposedly, while Lucretia Mott is walking out with her female friends from the uh, anti slavery convention of American women, one of them is, well, oh, what are we going to do? What are they going to do? You know, who's, who's going to protect us? And Lucretia looks out into the, into the mob and finds this big guy and says, that man will protect us. And that man walks over and walks them out of the mob. He was throwing rocks at the building before, but it's like, you know, here's Lucretia making a very personal connection. It's like, you know, you're not the kind of person that's going to harm a, you know, you know, a couple of, a couple of women. You know, you're going to be the one that protects us. And that's exactly what happened. The Mots also helped fugitive slaves. She was seen often in places known to be stations on the Underground Railroad. Even though that was important and dangerous work, her goals were more far-reaching. For people like Lucretia Mott, when they're looking, the, the, the point of the exercise is to get rid of slavery. You know, there, there are three and a half, up, and then four and a half million enslaved people. And the Underground Railroad is going to help a thousand of them a year, maybe two thousand of them a year. You know, there are many, many more people being born in slavery 
then are escaping through the Underground Railroad. So it's not the way we're going to get rid of slavery. And so Maude is happy to be involved in these activities, and she's got lots of friends that are heavily involved in the activities, but it's, it's not the main thing on the agenda. The main thing is to convince you know, the American public in general that this is a bad system. We've got to figure out a way uh, to get rid of it. Quakers struggle in every meeting, in every generation, in every locale to figure out what's okay for a Quaker to do, what's proper for a Quaker to do. And Lucretia Mott comes to her Quakerism out of the experience of an important schism among friends, where one set of friends, and there are a lot of different context for this, but one set of friends in a, in a sort of general way can be described as more rule followers. And Lucretia Mott finds herself on the side of the more rule breaker end of Quaker faith. Um, I don't think they would have described themselves as rule breakers, and so in some ways it's not quite fair. But they describe themselves as being led more by the inward guide than by outward things like reading the Bible or reading what early Quakers said. And so she's at the far end of the, you must follow what's inside, let your interior be your guide. She's at the far end of that, one might say at the far, far left of Quaker religious independence. And much of what she does is at that far end, so much so that even people within her own home meeting sometimes looked at her and said, you're going too far, uh, dial it back. Um, so she was sometimes ostracized in her home meeting, and she was certainly ostracized in some of the other more conservative Quaker meetings and Quaker gatherings. She was involved in one particular notorious incident in Lancaster County as part of what was known as the Christiana Riot, in which Castor Hanway was charged with treason following the death of a slave catcher. The slave catcher was killed while trying to recapture a runaway slave. Lucretia helped raise funds for Hanway's defense. The prominent lawyer who took the lead in that defense was Congressman Thaddeus Stevens. Records show multiple visits were made by Lucretia and her husband James during Hanway's detainment. But to Lucretia Mott, it was not enough to just deplore the evils of slavery. She also denounced the racism that pervaded society at the time. She applied her principles in a very practical way, boycotting products made by slave labor. Her most common theme was equality, whether in broad society or in the home. It's, you know, it's all the same kind of thing. Uh, having Euro-Americans tell Native Americans what to do, having you know, white masters telling black slaves what to do, having men tell women what to do, they're all forms of oppression, and that they're, they're very similar forms of oppression. Her landmark piece of writing is the 1850 Discourse on Women, which was a call for equal economic opportunity and voting rights. Her relationship with her husband James modeled that sense of equality. They worked together even though they possess different gifts. Oh, they're very, very definitely a partnership, and uh, in most cases of Lucretia somewhere, James is, is somewhere. Now, James Mott, uh, in the 19th century, after both James and Lucretia died, there's a, a book came out with their letters, and it's the correspondence of James and Lucretia Mott, because the two were always talked about together at the time. And now poor James has is, is disappeared. Because, of course, Lucretia is interesting because, you know, she's a woman, she's doing all this sort of thing. Uh, but James was the founder of the American Anti-Slavery Society. He was the founder of the American Free Produce Association. He was vice president of the Pennsylvania of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, he did all kinds of things. Uh, but one of the things he didn't do was he wasn't a public speaker. You know, he was content to have Lucretia go off and do that thing and to carry her bags while she did it. Uh, Lucretia was an acknowledged minister in the Society of Friends, and, and James was a, an elder in the Society of Friends. In other words, Lucretia was, you know, if you look at that in terms of uh, importance, you know, had the, had the 
the higher role. I don't think they would have thought necessarily of it in that fashion, but I really don't know if there were any occasions in their public life up until James's death in the 1860s when they weren't the same, they weren't going to go to the same place. In 1848, Mott and several others, including fellow activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, organized a women's rights convention at Seneca Falls, New York, the first public women's rights meeting in the United States. In Lucretia's mind, two words needed to be added to the defining phrase of American rights. She wanted it said that all men and women are created equal. The Seneca Falls Convention was indeed a big marker, but it went underground until 1980 when somebody said, let's do something about bringing it back to where people can see it. And then the Seneca Falls National Historic Site arrived. But the as a National Historic Site, it's really only a few years old. Um, and Lucretia Mott, it's time for her to come back. It's time for her to get top billing again. Um, it's time for her to be remembered. Mott was among the Quakers from Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York who founded Swarthmore College, motivated by the belief that having more educated women would help advance the cause of equality. Lucretia Mott is on one of the committees to raise money for Swarthmore. It's not, it's not a big role, but it's, it was significant at the time. It was also an effort to serve and you know, increase the quality of Quaker education generally. So it was sort of a guarded school for, for Quaker children. Today, Swarthmore frequently ranks among the top liberal arts colleges in the nation. With the formal abolition of slavery and the end of the Civil War, there were some ready to declare the end of slavery as mission accomplished. But for Mott, it was to borrow from Winston Churchill only the end of the beginning. She continued to push ahead to ensure African Americans and women the chance to fully participate in the economic and political life of America. When the Civil War ended, Garrison said, slavery is gone, we've done our job, they close it down. When the Mott's saying, okay, slavery is ended, but there's still these other things we've been dealing with, and things like the, the Philadelphia Female United Slavery Society, education, political rights. You know, if you, you know, if you don't secure those things, you know, what does it mean to be free if, if, if you're still hampered by social conventions and laws and, you know, can't sit on, can't choose your seat and sit on the bus and all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a long view of things and it's, it's a view of things that makes things interrelated. She was part of a matrix of people who saw reform as part of what they were supposed to do in the world. If you think of the major reforms of the modern era, the abolition of slavery. I mean, that is a huge reform. You know, it's a huge change. You know, it's, it's not something that's totally been achieved in, 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 in full, but that's, that's a major change in the way we think of society. And there's a lot of Quaker involvement with getting that movement going, and there's a lot of Lucretia Mott in getting that movement going. She was a tireless worker. So that's one of the major changes in American society and world society. Uh, the other big change has been the um, enfranchisement of women. Uh, the idea that women don't have to apologize or make excuses for having a public voice. You know, that's very much something that Lucretia Mott was in the uh, forefront of. And I would argue that that's a bigger change in how we view society than most of Americans' wars. At her death, Mott's contemporaries believed her to be the greatest American woman of the 19th century. She left a lasting legacy in the number of her works published, the changes to laws, even the Constitution, and in dramatic changes in society resulting from her determined advocacy and principled example. What set her apart was her capacity to translate lofty principles into effective action on the ground, to find new ways of attacking the evils of slavery and sins of exclusion. So why has Lucretia Mott fallen between the cracks of history? People recognize political figures, military figures, inventors, but they don't tend to have that much recognition of sort of social reformers. 
religious reformers outside of you know, very narrow denominational uh, limits. You know, here's somebody uh, who's not, you know, picking up a gun and going to fight the Confederates, but has, has been quietly working for, as the Civil War starts, um, you know, 30 years um, to make a difference in the world. You know, that, we don't, oftentimes we don't, we don't seem to want to recognize that, that kind of uh, heroic attitude. She's a plane landing, and the press doesn't cover plane landings. The press covers plane crashes. She never crashed. She just kept landing and landing and landing and landing over a lifetime. And she landed everywhere. She was in Indiana, she was in uh, Ohio, she was in North Carolina, she was in New England, she was in England, carrying a consistent message from place to place to place. People like Lucretia Mott and many, many others saw as young people that there are grievous problems. And so they set on the course of their lives to do something. And it didn't matter how long it took. It didn't matter if you, you had no assurance that you actually were going to win or win anything. It might be a totally hopeless cause, but uh, you know, God is saying that you know, the world you know, shouldn't be like this way. You know, that's, you know, that's your life work. If you live in Pennsylvania, it's easy to forget that there are heroes everywhere and heroines everywhere. Um, and that you really only need to look out your door to find people who have given their lives to making a national and international difference. And we haven't, as a state, done terribly well about appreciating them, about advocating for them, and about seeing ourselves in their reflected glory and being inspired by them. Mott has been honored only sporadically since her death. Not long after women secured the right to vote in 1920 and the effort to generate an Equal Rights Amendment began, the drafter of that amendment called it the Lucretia Mott Amendment, in honor of the woman whose advocacy inspired so many. And to mark the 100th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention, the U.S. Postal Service issued a three-cent stamp featuring three prominent women, including Lucretia Mott. Since then, her recognition has declined. Outside of Philadelphia, you don't hear much about Lucretia Mott, but through her actions, her principles, and her legacy, she deserves a prominent place in Pennsylvania's story, and that of our nation. We hope this edition of Rediscovering Pennsylvania's History Makers will help restore Lucretia Mott to her rightful place among our Commonwealth's greatest citizens. Just as this production was being completed, the United States Treasury announced a complete redesign of the five, ten, and twenty-dollar bills, including the selection of Harriet Tubman, a noted abolitionist, on the new twenty-dollar bill. But on the back of the redesigned ten-dollar bill would be none other than Lucretia Mott, Alice Paul, sponsor of the Equal Rights Amendment, named in honor of Mott, and three other suffragettes. It's a way of honoring their tireless efforts on behalf of women's rights. A remarkable tribute for a nation that more often pays tribute to its military leaders than to those who devote their lives to social change. Look at history. And what's history about? History is about the Civil War and World War II, and now it's about snipers. Uh, and there's very little in there that, that talks about these um, reformers. Mm -hmm. And even with reformers, what attracts people is people that, uh, seems to interest people is people that use violence or we're in violent situations. And so you know, it's like today we know a whole lot more about Malcolm X than we do about Martin Luther King. It's like, wait a minute. I mean, they're both important people. They show different kinds of things, but somehow we can relate to the militancy of one and not the uh, peaceful militancy of the other. Uh, and when we see American history, yeah, we, we see the Lincolns and we see the General Lees and the General Grants and, and all the rest of it, which is, a, which is a terrible problem because if you, one of the questions about history is what difference did something make? Um, would, there, would things have been out 
differently had these people not existed. And if you think of the major reforms of the modern era, the abolition of slavery, I mean, that is a huge reform. You know, it's a huge change. You know, it's, it's not something that's totally been achieved in, 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 in full, but that's, that's a major change in the way we think of society. And there's a lot of Quaker involvement with getting that movement going, and there's a lot of Lucretia Mott in getting that movement going. She was a tireless worker. So that's one of the major changes in American society and world society. Uh, the other big change has been the um, enfranchisement of women. The, the idea that women don't have to apologize or make excuses for having a public voice. You know, that's very much something that Lucretia Mott was in the uh, forefront of. And I would argue that that's a bigger change in how we view society than most of Americans' wars. Uh, it's, it's just a major thing. And then the, uh, the third big reform that, that you would be associated with is peace and nonviolence. And unfortunately, that's the one we haven't gotten as far as we have on the other two reforms. Uh, Quakers tend to hope that, yes, someday uh, this will be possible, and to live in the light that it is possible, and that's the way you should be behaving. Uh, but you really can't point and say, oh, yes, we've done a success, uh, given this, the state of the world today. Uh, so I would argue that those three things are the biggest social changes we've had in the last 300 years. And two of them uh, were, had a heavy Quaker involvement and had a heavy Lucretia Mott involvement.